at one level fear is like a constant background noise in our lives but sometimes it starts coming to the foreground like a shrill or even a scream and that is the time when we start taking greater notice of it and then we have to deal with it but let's look at uh, i'll talk about this in three broad parts first we'll differentiate between fear and fearfulness and then i'll talk about what causes fear and then i'll talk about how we can deal with our fears so first of all fear itself is not a bad thing it's not something that we necessarily have to get rid of fear is a natural and desirable response to danger biologically and psychologically we have been we have evolved and in, in designed in such a way that we basically we, we protect ourselves from danger and the sensation or the emotion that points us to danger is fear so fear is not only natural it is even essential for our safety so if there is danger and we feel fear then we are protected so say we are here the danger is here and in our mind there is emotion of fear we take the necessary emotion precautions then however different from fear is fearfulness so as the word fearfulness means we are full of fear so that means that the stimuli the the response the reaction of fear is present even when the danger is not present or even when the danger is present in a relatively less pronounced way so basically one reason why we as a society are much more fearful than maybe a few decades or a few centuries ago and this is seen from the sheer number of people who have mental health issues one of them is anxiety one the reason is that so as i said there is the stimulus which is the danger then there is a reaction a response which is fear and we are the experiencer so we perceive the stimulus stimulus and we experience the response and that way we create a safe create or maintain a stay safe distance between us and the danger however as our society has become more and more complicated our economy our political arrangement our social interactions so the the dangers to us have become less and less tangible so so a uh, animal a deer in a jungle has a very tangible object of terror that's a tiger or lion but for us not many of us really live in fear that some Uh, some person will pounce on us and uh, rob us that's a fear but our fears are much more uh, diffused so now because of globalization uh, so something that happened in the uh, markets of wuhan in china that's affecting the whole world and a virus is so small how do, how do you fight with it or if the global economy goes down then there is no tangible enemy there's no tangible source of the danger and because of that what happens is the danger is there and it is left to our mind to decide whether the danger is something which is like a constant background noise or it should become a shrill in one sense insecurity is always there in the world but sometimes it is very pronounced so in the case in the world which we live in today whether the danger is pronounced or not because the danger its source of the danger itself is not tangible so it's very difficult for us to process it and that's why our brains and our minds tend to stay in a constant mode of being hyper alert and that's how we become more and more fearful so fear is healthy but fearfulness is unhealthy unhealthy because first of all we exhaust ourselves faster and another reason is because it distorts our perceptions in some ways 
if we are on high alert, it's good. But if you have to constantly stay on high alert, it is not that easy. It's like say in army, if the soldiers have to be constantly, 24 hours a day at attention, they'll get exhausted very quickly. So for us, when we have to constantly be high alert, and when should we be high alert, that is left for our mind to decide. That's how we end up becoming fearful. So now, basically, how does fear arise? So there's, as I said, there's a danger outside and there is a response inside. Now when the response comes, it comes primarily by, uh, of the, by the imagination of our mind. The yoga texts of ancient India posit a three-level conception of the human being. That we human beings are not just physical creatures, there's the body, there's the mind, and there's the consciousness. So this is something similar to a computer program, whether it's hardware, software, and user. So there is a physical danger. And then there is a, that's the, at the hardware level, some signal comes in. At the software level, some notification comes up, oh, there's a danger, and we have to respond to it. So when there is fearfulness, when we have to, if we have to face our fears, we need to un understand the difference between fear and fearfulness. And the difference is, says, ideally speaking, the body, the, the, the consciousness, the mind and the, and the body, they need to be aligned in one line. And when they're aligned in this way, then proper perception takes place. But when there is misalignment, that's when our mind starts imagining some things. That's when we become absent-minded. The classic example of absent-mindedness is say somebody has a ranch and they are riding on a horse, searching all over the ranch for the horse on which they are riding. <laughs> Where is my horse? Where is my horse? They're worried. So what has happened is, when, so the consciousness is here, the mind is here and the, the body is here. So you could say consciousness is like the source of light, like the bulb. Uh, so, so that is, the source of the consciousness is what is sometimes called as the soul. From the soul, consciousness comes out as a beam of light. And consciousness comes to the mind and through the mind to the outer world, to the physical level. So when there is misalignment, so the, the we, the perceivers are here, and then there's a misalignment with the, between the body and the mind. That's when fear starts going out of control. That means what is the reality and what is the imagination. We are unable to differentiate and then we get caught. Once there was a woman, she went to a doctor and she said that, Doctor, doctor, oh, there's a frog in my stomach. And the frog is running around and creating havoc. The doctor said, no, there's no frog there. A frog can't survive here. No, it's there. So the doctor said it's not there. She went to a second doctor, third doctor. Finally, when she went to a tenth doctor, what happened? The tenth doctor heard her story, how she had been so many doctors. So she said that, okay, let me check. And he checked. Oh, really? And actually, I can sense a frog here. Oh, thank God. What do you need to do? He said, we have to do surgery to operate it and remove it. Okay, when do you want to do it? He says, right away. Okay. Then they, Landed, and then he gave her anesthesia and did some small incisions near her belly and he told one of her nurse, you know, his nurses to go to a nearby pond and get a small frog from there. Now when he came back with the frog, she came back to consciousness and she said, this was the frog we found in your belly. <sighs> Thank God. <sighs> you can relieve me of so much anxiety. Nobody was ready to believe me, but you believe me. <sighs> I'm free from this fear now. She went away and the doctor and the medical staff saw that as a, as a clever solution. And a week later she came back. In great anxiety, she said, doctor, doctor, the frog had babies. <laughs> <laughs> so what happens when the mind has its imagination, there is a misalignment between the body and the mind. And when that happens, 
the mind starts imagining and the imagination cannot be dealt with except at the level of the mind. So physical things can be dealt at the physical level. We have to under, we have to identify the mind and we have to distance ourselves from it.